Okay, so in general, the levels of organization from smallest to largest. And so we're going to talk um, from, from our, our level, first level of living organisms, or first level of life is the cell. Cells, if you have a group of cells working together to perform a function, what's that? A tissue. A tissue. In the body, there are four tissue types, epithelial, muscular, connective, and nervous. A group of tissues working together, organ. So an organ would be like the heart, the lungs, the liver, the stomach. Okay, we need to stop all the side conversations because it's getting picked up and it, it, it makes this like background rumble when I'm recording. Um, and then organs are grouped into organ systems. In the human body, we have 11. And organ systems make up organisms. Okay, so there are 11 organ systems, and the organ systems that make up the human body, you should hopefully be able to name those. We skipped the reproductive system. Not that it isn't important, but it's the only one that you can live without. Okay. So, you guys, yes, you will not reproduce offspring, but that you, there's lots of people that can't reproduce. Okay, so, our body systems, we're going to talk about the first three here, skeletal, muscular, and integumentary. We took the skeletal and the muscular systems and combined those into one one-pager. So, the structures of the skeletal system would be bones but not just bones, the connective tissue. So we've got cartilage, and we have ligaments. Okay, it's the writing on this thing here. Come on. T-I-L-A, okay. Okay, cartilage and ligaments. Okay, bones, cartilage, and ligaments. The structures of the muscular system would be muscles. <laughs> muscles and tendons. Okay, so... Um, so that I can write this a little bit more neatly there. I'll expand it and... I'm rewriting this just because it's... Okay. The structures of the integumentary system, skin, hair, and nails. Okay, functions of each of these. Yes, you're getting under my skin. I heard you. He's like saying all these puns. I know. <laughs> I know, I hear him. <laughs> Okay, the function of the skeletal system. So what what's purpose do our bones serve? Well, pr protection of internal organs, support, help us to stand upright. You guys did the one pager. What else? Why do you have bones? Oh, great. To make so we wouldn't be a, just a bag of jelly. Right? Bones act as a system of levers. Okay. Okay, structure to the body. Okay, blood cell formation. And let's not forget calcium.
storage. Okay, you guys need to stop the talking because I am recording. Thank you. Okay, muscular system functions. <coughs> Movement. But one you may not have thought of is heat production. And I'm talking about shivering, right? Integumentary system. The number one reason we have an integumentary system is protection. It keeps out foreign pathogens. Keeps the outside out and the inside in. Heat regulation. We can regulate our heat by opening up or um, constricting blood vessels in our skin. <clears throat> Vitamin D synthesis. We make vitamin D in our skin with ultraviolet light. With the sun, you should get about 15 minutes of sun exposure every day. <laughs> not because of photosynthesis, so that you can make vitamin D. You're not photosynthesizing, okay? None of you are green, right? None of you have chloroplasts. Uh, freshman. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you're not there yet. Okay. Okay. Moving along. Okay. Circulatory and respiratory systems. I'm still recording. Circulatory and respiratory systems. Um, first of all, uh, the questions that are not here are the obvious ones. What are the structures in the circulatory system? The circulatory system is your heart, heart lungs, and blood vessels. Is every teacher here on campus today? No. 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 Only the lucky ones. Okay, so look, our time is, is running short. And I have other things to do today. Okay. So respiratory system is going to be our lungs. Okay, and uh, like the trachea and the other air pathways. Oh, let's not forget the blood. We'll include the blood in with the, the circulatory system. So on our one pager, we put these two systems together because they work so closely with each other. So the difference between a white blood cell and a red blood cell, other than the obvious, a white blood cell is white and a red blood cell is red because really a red blood cell truly is red, but a white blood cell is clear. Okay, it's clear. It, it doesn't have color. The difference between these is not in their structure, but in the job that they do. The job of the red blood cell is to carry oxygen. Whereas the job of the white blood cell is defense. White cells are carried by our bloodstream, but they're really part of our immune system. What is hemoglobin and its function? Okay, hemoglobin is a protein. You find it in red blood cells. And its function is to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. Wait, you want to 
It's a protein. Hemoglobin is a protein. Red blood cells. Okay, it's carried in red blood cells. Okay, it's it's a it's the protein in a red blood cell that allows the red blood cell to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. And the reason why I, once I learned this little fact that I'll share with you, it, I, I stopped, I became a, afraid when I saw my kids inhaling helium out of balloons. <laughs> helium, helium, the gas helium, your hemoglobin likes to be attached to helium molecules more than it likes to be attached to oxygen. It has a higher affinity for helium. And so everybody's, everybody's amount of helium that they can inhale is different. It's not the same for everybody. But at some point, your blood can become saturated with helium rather than saturated with oxygen, and you suffocate. Yes, you would die. So... So, the reason, <laughs> the reason why, shh, okay, you guys, the, the reason why helium makes your voice go high is because the helium gas gets trapped on top of your larynx when you, when you inhale it, and the sound waves travel differently through the helium gas. There is another gas, and I cannot remember which one it is, that actually makes your voice um, very, very low. Okay, so um, the, the concern is, is that if you're inhaling these gases and your blood becomes saturated with those dissolved gases rather than oxygen, then you suffocate on a, on a cellular level. Not because you're not moving air in and out, like, like if you, you know, someone was choking you, right? It, it would be because of your blood cannot carry the oxygen. So that's kind of scary to me. How are oxygen dissolved nutrients and waste exchanged in the body and through which type of blood vessel does this happen? All right, so I draw you pictures. Aw, oh. oh, pictures. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna show you that the lungs come down and you have one tube, the trachea, which branches into two main branches and you have two lungs on either side. Okay, these Do you need me to go through this? Because if you don't, I'm using a lot of energy that I don't need to. Okay, these branches get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually you get down to a level where you have just a tube. There's cartilage rings around all of this to keep it open all the time. You get down to a level where it's just a smooth muscle and these little clusters of air sacs called alveoli. Now, smooth muscle can move on, and contract. Um, it's under involuntary control, so you, conscious, you, you have no conscious control over it. So these tubes here are lined with smooth muscle. This is what asthma is all about. In asthma, the smooth muscle here contracts and constricts the airways, and you can't move oxygen or air as well. And that's why you get wheezing. This whole tubular system is all lined with smooth muscle. So the gas exchange is actually happening at that level, at the alveoli level. And so if I draw an alveoli, Around the alveoli is a network of blood capillaries. Your skin is your first line of defense. And it's a non-specific defense. Your skin just keeps everything out, hopefully, unless it gets cut. And then, now you've opened yourself up to potential invasion by pathogens. Are there parts of our body that are extra vulnerable, ports of entry, yeah. right? So every, every wall has to have some gates. Something has to be able to go in and out. But what do you put next to the gate? 
a guard, right? So let's think of let's think of the places on our body where we have vulnerabilities. Our mouth, our nostrils, our eyes, our ears, and then the urethra, the vagina, and the anus. These are all openings to the inside of our body where the inside is accessible from the outside. And so bacteria, parasites, all of these things can get into our body through those points. So those points better have guards. Okay? So you've got things like tears, mucus, hair, oil glands. You have hair inside your ear so that it makes it a little bit harder for things to crawl in. And then you have wax, which is called cerumen, which is antimicrobial. You have antibiotic properties to the tears, the, the material in your tears. And your tears, when you get something in your eye, what does your eye do? Your, your eye starts to water like crazy to flush it out. Why do you have eyelashes? Okay, to get dust and to keep to try to keep things from going into your eyes. Okay. So um, the vagina produces mucus, the anus produces mucus, and the anus is a very tight opening to keep things out. Now our mouths very vulnerable because our mouths are open, and some of your mouths are open more than others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come back. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, so now that we've recovered. So, even inside of our mouth, we, you know, when we swallow something and it goes into our stomach. Saliva goes down with it, but there's nothing in saliva that's going to help to kill pathogens, but you have acid in your stomach. Okay? And the fact that sometimes when you eat something, and if it's, if it's not good, your body's going to cause you to vomit, because that's the quickest way to get out whatever has gotten in. That's, that's a safe safety mechanism. So, we have nonspecific skin, tears, and mucus. Now, if something gets past our skin, past our tear ducts, or our, um, then we have the inflammatory response. Okay, and, and this is a very complex process but you guys understand what swelling is, inflammation. So when you get um, bitten by a mosquito, you get a little inflammation. If you're allergic to it, then maybe you get really inflamed. If you get a paper cut, it gets red and inflamed, and that's inflammation. If you get stung by a wasp or a bee, depending upon your level of allergic reaction, you become inflamed. If somebody scratches you and you get a red mark, that's inflammation. You get a tetanus shot in your arm and it gets swollen and hard and it's hot there. That's inflammation. All of that is caused by the same mechanism and your body responds to a varying degree, more inflammation, less inflammation, depending upon the trauma to the tissue. But it's a nonspecific response, inflammation. So those are all nonspecific ways. It, your body doesn't know what it's responding to. It just knows there's something wrong. Now... These nonspecific responses lead to specific responses, which are going to be tailored to destroying whatever pathogen and specifically seeking out pathogens and remembering pathogens. Okay? So three things that the immune system has to be able to do. It has to recognize... It has to recognize a pathogen... It has to respond to the pathogen, and it has to remember. Okay. 
So you have to know the difference between self and non-self and what is, oh yes, that is a, a pollen grain in my nose, but hey, it's not dangerous. Versus, oh my God, it's a pollen grain. S swell up, swell up, swell up. Start watering your eyes, right? And you get allergies, okay? That's what your immune system's doing. It's going, ah! and everything starts to swell and your eyes start to water and your nose starts to water as if it was the most dangerous virus. Okay, that's allergic reactions to things. If you get a really crazy allergic reaction, it's called anaphylactic shock and your airways swell up and close. So it's an over response. Yes, question. Why would your body react Why would your, well, it's, it's like a, a, a positive feedback loop that the swelling creates more swelling, which creates more swelling. And so it's, it's, it's a, an overreaction. It's not, an, it's an, a mistake. Okay. <laughs> and, it, and if you have an autoimmune disease, your own immune system can start to recognize yourself as non-self. And then your body attacks your own body like lupus. So that's not, that's not good. That's an autoimmune. So you're self, you're becoming immune to yourself. Shh. Or you're becoming allergic to yourself, basically. Okay, so, the re so recognizing is going to be the responsibility of looking at something called an antigen. Antigen. Okay, there's a vocabulary term for you. you I'm sure you saw that. Um, we didn't do... Well, we did lymphatic and immunity, so you read about antigens. Okay, antigens are um, surface identification markers on cells. Okay, so on a cell, here's a little cell, it has little ID markers. Those are antigens. Okay, and they identify a cell. Antigens identify cells. So our body's immune system has learned to recognize our own antigens. And when our white blood cells go along and they're checking out things and making sure everything's in order, they can say, yep, that belongs, yeah, that belongs, that belongs. But if your white blood cell encounters a foreign antigen, alarms go off, this, is not, this does not belong, I do not know what this is. And there's a couple of things that can happen, and it's, it's a lot more complicated than we have time for. It can sometimes immediately eat up the cell and destroy it, or it can engulf the cell and take those antigens, the white blood cell can take those antigens and display those antigens like little, I, I don't know, like alerts for the rest of the immune system to say, hey, this is what we're looking for. This, this guy doesn't belong. It puts out like an APB, you know? Okay? It's, it's like an amber alert. It says, hey, everybody, this is what we're looking for. This is the antigen that we want to get rid of. And your body then is going to start looking specifically for that antigen. And it does that through what's called the antigen-antibody reaction. So antigens are surface markers on cells. Antibodies... An antibody is a protein made by you to recognize a specific antigen. So you have cells that have engulfed this pathogen, right? And now they're displaying the antigen on the surface saying, this is what you look for. Your immune system, they're called plasma cells, make antibodies and then say, okay, here. This is like, a, like little heat-seeking missiles that they go and they look specifically for that antigen. And when, they find that, when the antibody finds that specific antigen, it connects to it. And now it's like this beacon that alerts the rest of the immune system. This is the, this is the invader. This is what we want to come kill. And then your other immune system cells come along and kill it. And there's a whole bunch of different ways. The immune system is very, very cool. 
immunology is, is really amazing. Now, you guys have all lear, heard of HIV yeah. and AIDS. Okay. This is, this is where HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Let's think about it. human. It affects humans. It doesn't affect dogs and cats. It affects humans. It's a virus. So there's the V. Immunodeficiency. It makes your immune system deficient because the cells that are directly impacted by HIV are the cells that alert the rest of the immune system to respond. HIV directly attacks and kills helper T cells. And so it totally disables your immune system by killing helper T cells. So the HIV virus itself has never killed anybody. It kills your immune system. And then something else comes along that if you have a normal healthy immune system, you get better, you're fine. But a person who has HIV is immunocompromised or immunodeficient and so they die from the common cold or they start to get all of these weird types of diseases that other people with healthy immune systems don't get and that's what we call AIDS acquired immunodeficiency syndrome all of the other diseases that you acquire that are associated with HIV question why would HIV want to kill its host it it, it, it doesn't. It's, it doesn't have a brain. It's just surviving. It's, it's not, well, there's a question, is our, our, our virus is even alive? I mean, they're not sentient. They don't have thought. And they're not, they don't meet the requirements of life. It's, its function is to reproduce, and it can only reproduce through infecting a host organism. Yeah, it, it's, it's result, it, it's hope. I mean, it, oh, well, we're personifying it, but... The purpose is, is to make more of yourself. You can't make more of yourself without having a host. So it has to infect cells because viruses cannot manufacture themselves. They can't replicate themselves. They have to infect a host cell in order to, to co make copies. They take over the host cell. That makes copies. So what, how does that virus spread from one individual to another? Okay, not by coughing. HIV? HIV is only spread through blood, semen, vaginal fluids, anal fluids, and breast milk. Yes. So it is possible for a baby to be born to an HIV-positive mother and not be HIV-positive, but when she breastfeeds it, then it will contract the HIV virus. Well, yes, and, but women would do this unknowingly. The HIV virus is small enough to get through the openings in a condom, too. So condoms are not 100% effective against the spread of HIV. So the only way to protect yourself from HIV is complete you know, abstinence from sex, regular testing. Um, we test our blood supply to protect. Yes, questions? Is the immune system developed through evolution? Is the immune system ev developed through everything has been developed through evolution? Like all the systems as it's needed, it's developed? Yeah. Well, no, not as it's needed. It, it, that's thinking backwards. That's, you got to think. Those, yes, those organisms that were better able to fight off pathogens had a better chance of surviving. The longer you survive, the more opportunities you get to reproduce. The more you reproduce, the more you pass on DNA and make others like you. So to, to say, um, you know, that to say it the other way implies that somebody was directing. Okay, so we talked about number three, we talked about number four, antibiotics. What kind of diseases are antibiotics effective against? 
only bacterial infections. So if you have um, a cough and a runny nose and maybe a little fever and some body aches and you've been sick for a couple of weeks and you're just kind of like suffering through it, you don't have a bacterial infection. You have a viral infection. And so you can go to the doctor and they can give you cough medicine and something to help you with your aches and pains. But you absolutely should not be taking antibiotics. Antibiotics are completely useless against viral diseases. The way antibiotics work is they um, kill bacteria. But viruses can't be killed the same way because, number one, we don't say they're even alive. But number two, in order to destroy viruses, you have to destroy your own body cells because viruses can't replicate without getting into your body. So basically what you do when you have a viral infection is you just take medications to make you feel better until your body's immune system can mount the response to destroy the virus and keep it from spreading. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. So, like, every time I like, go to the doctor, like, they usually just give us an antibiotic, but, like, sometimes, like, if they don't tell us if it's a viral or bacterial infection, like, they just give it to us. Yes, that's a misuse of antibiotics. So then, like, if we ask them, like, Okay, ask if you are, t okay, if it is, a, when I got really sick before spring break, okay, um, my, my lymph nodes were all swollen, I was running a fever, I, I, I was really, really sick, and the doctor said, you know, I, I, they, they cultured my throat, and they said, you know, this, this is definitely bacterial. They gave me antibiotics, and within 72 hours, boom, I was better. If it had not been bacterial... Would I have been any better in 72 hours? No. Okay. Now, here's the concern with the overuse of antibiotics. Honor students who are going to go on and become doctors and such. Okay. Listen up. Listen up. You, you prescribe these antibiotics, and what's happening is we're creating evolution is happening. That's what's happening. Because bacteria, people say, oh, I'm going to take these antibiotics, and oh, I'm not getting any better. Oh, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to take them anymore. And they don't finish the antibiotics, and there are bacteria that become stronger because they've learned how to, those that were resistant to the antibiotics survived, like the question on the last test about the insecticides and the bugs. It's natural selection, people. And so now we have, because of the overuse of antibiotics, all of these superbugs, which are not insects, we call them superbugs, they're pathogens, they're bacteria, that are resistant to the strongest antibiotics that we have because antibiotics have been so overused. And think about it, antibiotic soaps, antibacterial lotions, you know, people say even hand sanitizer is a concern, okay? So... <laughs> Oh, he goes and gets more hand sanitizer. Well, you might, you know what? You could bathe in that and still not get all the bacteria off of your body. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know what? You have to read carefully. That's only off of a non-porous surface, okay? Off of a non-porous surface. You guys, unfortunately, we are porous surfaces. So you could wipe yourself down with a Clorox wipe and you would still have bacteria on you. Because they're natural. They're supposed to be there. All right, um, I think we've really covered everything here on the immune system. All right, I'm going to pause and we'll go to the next chapter. All right, sorry if, if, if this is going to be a downer after the last one. Um, so, structures of the digestive and the excretory system. So, you should be able to um, write down the start of digestion to the end. So, I'm going to do that for us here. I got to write. Okay, so we can start with the mouth to the esophagus If you sp spell it esophagus, you'll always spell it correctly. Esophagus. 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 To the stomach. <laughs> Hopefully not to the lungs, because then you've aspirated something and you're going to choke to death. Okay, to the small intestine.
Yeah, stone match to the large intestine. Did you not be able to spell large? <laughs> and then, oops. Rectum. Oh. Anus. Oh, I wrote something. Okay, the large intestine is also referred to as the colon. And we can get into other parts, like the first part of the large intestine is called the cecum. And then you have the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colons. That's more, more information than you need. Okay, so... These, what I've written for you, are called true digestive organs because the food actually passes through them. You have accessory digestive organs like the liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas, which help in digestion, but the food doesn't actually go through them. Why do people get their pancreas removed? You can't have your pancreas removed. You would die. Why do people get their gallbladder removed? Because in the gallbladder, you can develop stones. There's bile in there. And, and they're not kidney stones. They're called gallstones. <laughs> kidney stones are where? <gasps> in your kidney. Okay? And so <laughs> gallstones are in your gallbladder. <laughs> I know. Sometimes the brain is, you know, not really directing what's coming out of the mouth. <laughs> Okay, so you can live without your gallbladder. Your gallbladder stores bile. Bile is made by the liver, and it's stored in the gallbladder, and then it gets secreted into the small intestine, and it helps with digestion. Sometimes your bile salts can solidify and form little stones, which will then block the duct that would carry the bile into the small intestine. It gets blocked. It can get infected. It's extremely painful, and so they'll remove it. Okay. Um, in, at the junction between the small intestine and the large intestine, there is a little dangly, worm-like looking structure called the appendix. It has an entrance, but it doesn't have an exit. It's like a little pouch that's flattened. And in other animals, it has an immune function and it's part of the digestive system. But for us, it's really a vestigial organ. It's part of our evolutionary path, but it's no longer functional for us. And you don't know you have one until it gets infected. So an appendicitis is bacteria have started to grow inside of that, and it swells. And if it ruptures, then it spews all that bacteria um, and pus and stuff into our peritoneal space, our abdominal cavity, and can be deadly. Yes, question. No, everyone has an appendix, but you don't know it's there unless something goes wrong with it, okay? It's like wisdom teeth. Um, now, not everybody has wisdom teeth, but wisdom teeth were there so that before dentists, when we were eating a plant-based diet and doing lots of chewing, about halfway through your lifespan, your molars would start to wear out and you needed a new one. And our jaws used to be larger, through evolution of the evolution of humans, our jaws have become smaller, and so there's not as much room. And we really like to have nice straight teeth. So in your teenage years or your early 20s, which used to be middle age, okay, because people only lived into their 40s if they were lucky, okay? Well, I'm talking caveman days, okay? Um, you would lose teeth, and you needed a new molar to come in to help you grind food. Nowadays, we don't want those wisdom teeth because it makes all of our other teeth crowded because our jaw is smaller and there's not room for them. And so we tend to get them pulled out here in the United States before they mess up our pretty pearly whites that we spent so much money at the orthodontist getting straightened. Okay. Question. It's not that we needed it in the past. It, what, it, it's, it's a part of the digestive, digestive tract of other animals, and you know we share a common ancestor. And so our diet has changed, and our digestive tract is not as long.
because we aren't eating a plant-based diet anymore. You know, we were evolved to be omnivores, not just plant eaters. So our digestive tract is shorter and, you know, we just don't use that part. It's, it's, sh it's very small, but it's still there. Okay, um, excretory system in order, starting with the kidneys. So if we have a kidney, the kidney produces urine. The urine drains into the ureter, which is then stored in the urinary bladder. which passes out of the body through urethra. <laughs> Please don't name any of your children urethra. <laughs> it's not a name. I mean, it's not, it's it, Aretha, like Aretha Franklin. No, no, not urethra. Please don't. <laughs> You know what? I, someday I'm going to read an article about the child that was scarred for life with the name urethra. And, the, and they're going to interview their parents and they're going to say, well, I, I was in biology and we were studying for the final. Oh my God. Okay, so the functions of the digestive system, that should be pretty straightforward to you guys. It's going to be. Um, Ingestion, ingestion, so taking food in, digestion, which is the breaking down of food, and then absorption. Getting the food into your bloodstream. The functions of the excretory system are filtration of the blood by your kidneys. Why are you scared? <laughs> and the result is urine. Urine is what's the waste products that are left over. So. At any given time, 25% of your blood volume is in your kidneys. So that's why damage to the kidneys, you know, it, you don't punch people in the back. You, you know, you don't, um, getting shot or a stab wound in, in that area, you, you run the risk of bleeding to death. Or internally bleeding, um, it, you don't ever punch in that area. Because your kidneys don't have anything protecting them except for a pad of fat. And so people who um, become bulimic or anorexic will lose so much weight that, that ki the kidney can actually sag inside of their um, abdominal cavity. And when their kidneys start to sag down, it can cut off the blood flow to them and they will go into what's called renal failure, kidney failure. That's one of the reasons why anorexia is bad and bulimia. It's not the only reason. Uh, the, the better hydrated you are, the clear, clear urine is the best urine. You want, you want your urine to be clear. totally clear. That means you have enough water. The more yellow your urine is, the, the, the more concentrated it is, the less water. And we have hormones that help us to regulate our fluid balance and so on, okay? Okay, the nervous system. Draw a neuron, label the different parts, and explain what par each part does. Okay. So I'll, I'll draw a neuron, and I'll just do it on a separate page here for you guys. Huh. Okay, really simple. I, I think this looks like a little man with one eye and crazy hair. Okay. He has no arms. Okay. So this is a this is my very simple neuron. My very simple neuron has dendrites. A cell body.
and an axon. Oh, gosh. Okay, so that red dot in there is supposed to be the nucleus. Inside of the cell body. And incoming information is going to come in and be received at the dendrites. And then it's transferred along, a, an impulse is transferred along the cell membrane and in only one direction, from dendrites down the, to the cell body to the axon. I know. Now this is a, a, a chemical electrical wave. Nothing actually touches. So when you have an axon and it ends, right, there's another axon, at the ends, If I expand this out, what you actually see is the end of the axon, and inside are little vesicles. And inside of those vesicles are chemicals called neurotransmitters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys did a one-pager on the nervous system. And you drew a neuron, <laughs> okay? So neurons don't actually touch each other, okay? They don't actually touch each other. It's not like, oh, poke, you're it, and carry the message. It's not how it works, <laughs> okay? So here is, we'll call this axon... A, okay, this is nerve A, and here's the vesicles, and inside the vesicles are the neurotransmitters, so I put some little dots in there, it's hard to see, and right next to it are the dendrites of nerve B, and they are not touching. The neurotransmitter is released and flows across this space. And that space is called the synapse. And so they don't transfer information. They are just signals that are received. They dock, they're, they're proteins, and they dock with the dendrite, the postsynaptic neuron, and they stimulate the membrane, the cell membrane. And a wave of an electrochemical impulse travels down the membrane of the receiving neuron. So nerves are not touching each other. They are relying on chemical messengers. Now, drugs can do a lot of different things. Speed. Drugs like speed are excitatory, and they can mimic neurotransmitters, and therefore, instead of having a little bit of that neurotransmitter, it acts like there's a whole bunch in there, and that nerve gets overstimulated, and that's why it's a stimulant. A depressant... Things that slow you down, like um, alcohol and marijuana and things like that, those block your neurotransmitter receptor sites, and so your cells aren't responding. They're just <laughs> chillax and slow down. Okay. Okay. So, um... There, we just talked about a neuron, function of the nervous system, communication. Oops, I want to do a drawing. I want to be able to write on this. Communication. Control. Coordination. So your body systems are going to be coordinated 
Your nervous system responds very quickly to stimuli, but the response is a short-lived response. The changes in your body that your nervous system brings about don't stay for, for days and weeks and months and years. Whereas the endocrine system is our other co coordination and control system, and those responses last for long periods of time. So we talked about neurotransmitters, and they get released from the, the ends of the axons. The dendrites detect the neurotransmitters. Um, a stimulus is something that excites your neurons, okay? A, 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 uh, your skin touching something hot is a stimulus, okay? Um, a pinprick, um, pressure, just, you know, how, how do I know that I'm grasping this, this pin? It's because of pressure, stimulus on pressure receptors in my hand that let me know where it is. Could, could you write if you couldn't feel your hand? It would be very, very, very difficult. Yeah. Because you wouldn't know. Walking is difficult if you can't feel your feet. Yeah. Because you don't know if your foot's level. You don't know the position of your feet. So we have nerve receptors in all of our joints called proprioreceptors that tell us what position our body's in so that we know the orientation of our body. I'm starting to lose you guys. I can feel it. Okay, I, I understand that, but it's your final, and how prepared do you want to be? Prepared. Okay. We talked about the synapse. We've talked a lot about homeostasis. Okay, negative feedback. We've talked a lot about this. Okay, negative feedback and positive feedback. We, negative feedback is where your body is going to return itself back to homeostasis. So if you're cold, you shiver to get warmed up. If you're hot, you sweat to cool off. Question? Um, what are the nerve receptors called for our joints? Proprioceptors? That's not going to be on your test, though. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but proprioceptors tell us where what position our body's in. Sweating is caused by the nervous system? Sweating is a homeostatic response, release of sweat. But yeah, it's a. Uh -huh. Okay, um, a positive feedback would be the body is pushed out of balance, like labor, when a woman goes into labor to have a baby. Um, you guys can look up a reflex arc. I'm not going to spend time on on that. Fifty and fifty one, chapter fifty and fifty one. Um, let's see. Endocrine system and reproductive system. This is the last one, and I think we're going to make it. Okay. Um, hormones and their functions. Okay. Hormones are chemicals. Are released in one part of the body. And they travel through the bloodstream. And they control or effect target cells in another place in the body. So they're released into the bloodstream. And their function is to target and cause other things, other structures to respond. And, and perform their function. So, for example, if your pituitary gland is in your brain, it is the master gland of your endocrine system. The pituitary gland releases hormones, which then travel through your bloodstream and cause other glands to release their hormones. The pituitary gland sends the signal. So, for example, ladies, you don't start ovulating until puberty. Okay, guys, you don't start producing sperm until puberty. Your gonads, your testes and your ovaries are stimulated by 
hormones that are released from your brain, from your pituitary gland in your brain. Follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, is released by the pituitary gland and it travels throughout your bloodstream and goes and it, it goes all over your body, but its target are the gonads. And so once your pituitary gland comes online and starts pumping out FSH, then that's when you start producing sperm and that's when you start ovulating. Growth hormone secreted from the pituitary gland. Its target is bones, muscles. You start growing at puberty, right? At a more rapid rate because of an ele ele elevation of growth hormone. That's secreted by the pituitary gland in your brain. Without your pituitary gland, you'd die because your other glands would never be stimulated because your pituitary gland wouldn't tell them to release their hormones. And if your pituitary gland has a tumor on it, then you might release too many other hormones and that's not good either. So there's lots of endocrinological issues that can happen with a, a defective pituitary gland. So just like the nervous system responded very quickly to stimulation, but the response was very short-lived, the endocrine system responds slowly but the effects are long-term. Uh, uh, puberty lasts years. It takes years to complete that process. Okay, main structures of the endocrine system are going to be our, our glands. Um, the endocrine system works very, very closely with the nervous system and the blood circulatory system. And I think you guys know the structures of the reproductive system. I don't need to go into those. It's the only system you can live without. The hormones involved in the reproductive system are going to be estrogen, Extra. estrogen, <laughs> testosterone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. And progesterone. <laughs> Okay, so I have been going on this for, it's 57, 58 minutes, okay, with a lot of breaks in between. We've been, it's, okay, I will stop now, and then as a class, we're going to play maybe a Kahoot, if you guys want to stay a little bit longer. So, this is the end of my recording. Good luck studying for your final.